Hi, Rose here. In my previous podcast video, we saw how Charles Russell became the first faithful slave. I showed you how the teaching and authority of the faithful and discreet slave actually started. We saw how Charles Russell started the Watchtower organization that currently has its headquarters based in Warwick, New York, and has close to 9 million members who refer to themselves as Jehovah's Witnesses. We also saw how Charles Russell was a complete narcissist. He was a con man, a fraud, a medical whack, a horrible husband, and a man who profited off those who listened to him and followed his personal opinions and interpretations of the Bible. But despite this, Charles somehow got many people to believe that he alone was the spokesman for God. Just like those men that claim to be the faithful and discreet slave today as the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, I'm going to show you what I found out about the man who took over after Charles Russell died, Joseph Franklin Rutherford. But before we go on, please make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons to help this video go out to a larger audience. Algorithms and all. You see, Charles Russell grew up with money, but that wasn't the case for his successor, Joseph Franklin Rutherford. Joseph Rutherford was Charles' attorney. You're going to see how Rutherford wanted what his employer, Charles, had. Over the next few podcast videos, I'm going to let you decide what type of man Rutherford really was. I'm going to show you how Rutherford lied, deceived, and forced his way to become the president of the Watchtower Publishing Company and leader of Jehovah's Witnesses as the faithful steward or faithful and discreet slave as they are referred to today. Men who claim to be the only ones able to dispense Bible truths for all of mankind. We're going to see exactly what happened between 1916, when Russell died, and 1919, when Jehovah's Witnesses believed Jesus chose the Watchtower organization to be his channel of communication. Later, I'll show you how Rutherford came up with the many rules that everyone who refers to themselves as one of Jehovah's Witnesses are under today. I'll show you how Rutherford turned the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, the Watchtower Organization, into the religion it is today. If that interests you, follow along. It's history of this organization that really matters because the history proves that this organization is built on nothing but lies. An organization that continually profits off its members to become the multi-billion dollar corporation fronting as the religious organization it is today. We learned about Charles. So let's have a look at Joseph Franklin Rutherford, the self-proclaimed judge and faithful slave. Joseph Franklin Rutherford was born on November 8, 1869 in Versailles, Morgan County, Missouri. His parents, James Calvin and Lenora Strickland Rutherford, were Baptists and farmers. When Rutherford was around 16, he started having an interest in pursuing a career in law. And like I said earlier, Charles Russell had money. Rutherford, on the other hand, had to work hard for his. In order to secure a loan for law school, he worked hard on his parents' farm and he sold encyclopedias door to door. Now, as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, we know a thing or two about going door to door, don't we? Anyhow. On May 5, 1882, when Rutherford was 22, he passed his bar examinations and started practicing law in Missouri. He worked as a trial lawyer, and he also served as a public prosecutor for four years. On one or two occasions, he was called on to act as a stand-in judge for the 8th Judicial Circuit Court of Missouri. Now, this wasn't a major judge position, but... Being the arrogant man Rutherford was, he insisted later on to be called judge. Now, this is something else to note. 
Rutherford married Mary Malcolm Fetzer, December 31st, 1891, in his early 30s, and had a son, Malcolm Cleveland, in 1892. So, Rutherford was an attorney who was married with a son. Remember that, because it's very important. In 1894, when Rutherford was about 34, two women, Cole Porters, who referred to themselves as Bible students and followed Russell's teachings, came to his office, selling the Millennial Dawn series, showing what God had in store soon. Rutherford wanted to get rid of them, so he bought three books. He took the books home and forgot about them. Well, about four weeks later, he picked the first volume up and started reading it, and it interested him. But Rutherford wasn't willing to just drop everything to become a Bible student following Russell and selling his books and publications door to door. He had his career as an attorney, and he also wanted to campaign for William Jennings Bryan, another attorney who ran for President of the United States in 1896, 1900, and 1908. After 15 years of practicing law in Missouri and campaigning for Bryan, Rutherford became legal advisor of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society Publishing Company, and he also decided to get baptized, following Russell's teachings. In 1907, Rutherford became Russell's private attorney, offering his services pro bono. As we learned, Russell was facing mounting legal problems because of his sales and profits from his self-proclaimed miracle weed and his well-publicized separation with his wife, Mariah. In 1909, Rutherford joined the New York State Bar. In late April or early May of that same year, an arrest warrant by the Pittsburgh court had been issued for Russell because he refused to pay alimony to Mariah and he was facing jail time. Authors Barbara Harrison and Edmund Gruse claimed Russell's move to Brooklyn was motivated because he wanted to get out of the jurisdiction of the Pennsylvania courts. They claim he transferred all of his assets to the Watchtower Society, as we learned in the last podcast video, so that he could declare himself bankrupt and avoid being jailed for failure to pay Mariah alimony. Well, Russell asked Rutherford if the Watchtower Society's headquarters could be moved from Pennsylvania to Brooklyn, New York. Russell wasn't as well known there, and as long as he was in New York, he wouldn't be arrested for his lack of alimony payments. Rutherford told him that because the headquarters had been established under the Pennsylvania law, the corporate name is the Watchtower Society could not be registered in New York State. But Rutherford suggested a new corporate name to be registered in New York and still be able to do everything they did in Pennsylvania, just under a different name in New York. So Rutherford organized the formation of the People's Pulpit Association and registered it as a corporation February 23, 1909. In part of the legal documents for this corporation that Rutherford filed, he wrote in the charter that the president would be elected for life and have full and absolute power and control of its activities in New York, the president at the time being Charles Russell. When Russell's arrest warrant was issued in early 1909, he literally skipped town, claiming he was going to proclaim God's message in Europe for five weeks. While Russell was away preaching his message in Europe, Rutherford, as his attorney, took care of all of the court costs and delinquent alimony that Russell was responsible for. Rutherford even posted a bond guaranteeing that Mariah would from then on receive her monthly alimony and expenses. Once all of that was done, the criminal proceedings against Pastor Charles Taze Russell were dropped, and he could come back to the States. But by this time, the society's buildings in Pittsburgh had been sold, 
and all staff had been moved to its new headquarters based in Brooklyn, New York, under its new name, the People's Pulpit Association. Eventually, that name was changed back to the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Now, sometime between 1909 and 1916, Rutherford went from not only being the organization's attorney to also becoming one of the seven directors in charge of running the business. In other words, Rutherford became one of the CEOs of the Watchtower Society. As Russell's health started to decline, Rutherford started representing him on trips to Europe, and he spoke many times on his behalf in the United States. So by Charles Russell's death on October 31st, 1916, Rutherford had become a well-known and important man among the Bible students and shareholders, both as a CEO of the organization and as a follower of Charles Russell's teachings. And boy, did Rutherford use that to his advantage. See, by 1916, the seventh volume of Studies in the Scriptures was due. Because of what Russell had been stating in the Watchtower and his Studies in Scriptures series of books, it was believed that Armageddon was coming any day, and this great work of getting this message out needed to take place. In Pastor Russell's last edition of Studies in the Scriptures, dated October 1, 1916, he stated in the foreword that things were all to play a major role in the movement during the next few years. But since Russell died, who is going to lead the Bible students for the next few years before they were taken to heaven and Armageddon was supposed to start? As their leader, Charles Russell told them what to do, much like the governing body with Jehovah's Witnesses today. But now Russell was gone, and the Bible students were at a loss. Now that might sound crazy, but what if all of the members of the governing body died today? Do you think as Jehovah's Witnesses, everyone would be wondering what to do? Do you think they would wonder who they were supposed to listen to now without their governing body to lead them? That's what happened. The Bible students wanted to know how to go forward. Another thing to remember, Russell had been in charge of the publishing business as well. So not only were the Bible students wondering who were going to lead them, the publishing company needed a new president. And this, my friends, is what Rutherford took advantage of. But the first thing Rutherford had to do was get rid of one of his major competitors, Paul Johnson. As I stated, the Watchtower Bible and Track Society was a publishing company printing and distributing magazines and books for a profit. The president, the vice president, the treasurer, the secretary, etc. of this publishing company had to be anointed. Back then, all those who were baptized as Bible students following Charles Russell's teachings were considered anointed. So to be on the board of directors, you had to be baptized following the teachings of Russell. I don't know. Maybe that's why Rutherford got baptized in 1907. We'll never know. Well, the charter of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society that Rutherford had put together stipulated that a board of directors would be the ultimate authority. And since Charles Russell was the major financial contributor to the society, the board agreed to permit him total supervision as he saw fit during his lifetime. So he pretty much had total control. After Russell's death, the board was to be directed according to the terms of Russell's will. And it was agreed that that would come to the front only after his death. Even Alexander H. McMillan, someone the organization speaks very highly of, and who was in prison with Joseph Rutherford in 1919, wrote that Russell was in fact the society in that he directed the policy and course of both the publishing company and the Bible students. Sometimes Russell would seek the advice of others on the board, but he was the one to decide what to do according to his best judgment, what Russell believed the Lord would have him do. 
At Russell's time of death in October 1916, the remaining members of the Watchtower Board of Directors consisted of the following people. William E. Page, William E. Van Amberg, Henry Clay Rockwell, W. Brennison, and H. Robson. Every man had been elected by the board at different times in accordance with the society's charter that Rutherford had set. Now, to get a better picture of what was going on at Bethel, Charles Russell was often called upon to straighten out disputes at Bethel, both doctrinally and business-wise, often caused by Joseph Rutherford and William Van Amberg, who at the time was the organization's secretary. Henry Rockwell had announced he wanted to leave Bethel because of his disputes with Alexander Macmillan and Joseph Rutherford, but Russell had pleaded with him to stay. On November 1st, 1916, even though Alexander Macmillan was not a member of the board, he summoned the board of directors to a meeting to be held that same day. And it was that day everyone knew trouble was brewing. Alfred Ritchie was the vice president, and he went to take the president's chair, which was left empty in the wake of Russell's death. But Macmillan put his hand across it, saying, we're saving that for the judge, meaning he wouldn't let Ritchie, the vice president, take charge of the meeting. He wanted Van Amberg, the society's secretary and treasurer, to be put in charge. And while all of this was going on, Joseph Rutherford was meeting with a close friend, Paul Johnson. Now, it's important to note that Johnson was a very well-educated man with knowledge of both Hebrew and Greek, and he was also the right-hand man of Russell's, even though he was not a permanent resident at Bethel, the Watchtower's headquarters in New York. Paul Johnson had a home in Columbus, Ohio. Russell would look to Johnson for his understandings of the Bible. I told you before, Russell didn't really know what he was talking about, even though he claimed to be the one who knew Bible truths and understandings. Russell didn't even know Greek or Hebrew, which is important because that's what the Bible was written in. Prior to his death, Russell had announced that arrangements be made for Johnson to serve the Bible students in Britain because of some internal business and congregation strife going on. As soon as Rutherford and Johnson heard of Russell's death, they immediately went to Brooklyn Bethel on November 2nd. On the same day, another board meeting was held, and a brother A.N. Pearson was elected as a member of the board to fill the vacancy caused by Russell's death. And Paul Johnson was sent to Britain to carry out Russell's plan to take care of the problems that were happening there. Ritchie, Rutherford, and Macmillan were assigned to take care of the arrangements for Johnson to go. And it was while Johnson was away in Britain that Rutherford started to take over as the president of the company. But you're going to have to come back to see exactly what Rutherford did both to become the president and to Paul Johnson, and why that's important. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please make sure to like and subscribe, and if you're able to, share with others. As always, take care and stay strong. Don't let those men in New York win. Thank you for watching. Clear warning. We don't want to have any friendship, whether socially or on social networks, uh, with Jehovah's enemies. It's We're not friends they, of the world. We're they will Jehovah's vanish friend. like smoke. So this, I thought this would be a nice memory aid. To this verse stay in the mind. Here's what Jehovah's promising. Hey. That's Jehovah's enemies. They're going to vanish like smoke.